Welcome to Precious Moments, a virtual launch of the Honorable Dr. Vivian and Dr. Neve Poe's book of photography. My name is Mohammed Lashmi. As the president of Ryerson University, I am delighted to open this virtual book launch today. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that Toronto is in the dish with one spoon territory. The dish with one spoon is treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. It's an honor for Ryerson University to host the virtual launch of Precious Moments. We look forward to holding an in-person launch in the future when it's safe to do so. We are grateful to the Honorable Dr. Vivian and Dr. Neville Poy for their support of Ryerson University and their commitment to higher education. Dr. Neville Poy recently donated his incredible collection of cameras and other photography equipment to the Ryerson University Library and Archives. Through this gift, our students now have access to these resources to enhance their learning. The Poi family has generously decided to donate all proceeds from book sales to Ryerson, which we truly appreciate. These events present a unique opportunity to share beautiful photography and hear the stories behind each image. Many thanks to Dr. Vivian and Dr. Neville Paul for giving us the honor of hosting this gathering. Thank you. Hello, I'm Janice Fukukusa, Chancellor of Ryerson University. I'm pleased to be part of this celebration honoring Dr. Vivian and Dr. Neville Poy's Book of Photography. Ryerson is known for its deep connection to the world of arts and culture. This incredible collection of images and stories will inspire and delight us all. And everyone appreciates the beauty of nature captured in time and space. But this book does more. It connects images with words and stories to create a unique experience for the reader. Now, please join me in welcoming the Honorable Dr. Vivian and Dr. Neville Poy with Paul Roth, the director of the Ryerson Image Center. Hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this conversation about the book Precious Moments with Vivian and Neville Poy. I am Paul Roth, and I wrote the introduction to this book. Neville is now retired from his career as a celebrated surgeon uh, and has spent recent years working uh, extensively as a photographer, which has actually been an avocation of his for many years, even decades. He evolved from his early work in film photography uh, to the new technology of digital, uh, which is now well established. And uh, throughout his life as a photographer, he has emphasized landscape and travel as his primary subjects. Vivian is a businesswoman, author, and retired senator serving in Canadian Parliament from 1998 to 2012. While in government, she proposed and lobbied for successful passage of Canada's Asian Heritage Month, which we now celebrate every May. But Vivian is also a gardener. And that is what brings us together today. Uh, the book Precious Moments is a collaboration between Vivian and Neville, photographs by Neville, uh, the text by Vivian, discussing the gardens that they share in Toronto and Muskoka, and talking not only about the pictures and how it is that Neville has experienced uh, the garden at a close remove 
uh, throughout their life together, but also uh, including some information about the gardens and how Vivian has made them as beautiful as they are. So now I'd like you to uh, have a look at some of the great pictures from this book uh, as a prelude to the conversation that we had. The book includes photographs made over many years, but in the space of the book, the pictures are organized by the seasons so that we actually pass from summer through fall into the winter and then finally ending in the spring. And as you can see, uh, many of these extraordinary photographs document the animals that Vivian shares the gardens with, uh, both in Muskoka and in Toronto. Uh, in many ways, they dominate the rhythms of the day and they are, uh, from the evidence of the photographs, one of the main reasons why these gardens uh, exist and why they have been so carefully uh, and gently tended by Vivian through the years. Neville is fascinated by the theater, by the drama that actually takes place in these gardens. And uh, the animals in many ways pose a challenge to him that I think he really relishes as a photographer. But the colors are equally as important. Uh, the drama of light and shadow, of the contrast of the colors and the textures, uh, not only outdoors, but indoors, as you see here. These images really emphasize how important gardens are in the daily life of both Vivian and Neville. And by extension, I think that they tell us how important gardens are to all of us, how gardens are really a place where we commune with nature and where we come to understand not only the world outside our doors, uh, but also our own lives uh, a form of humility that we all have to have in the face of nature. The beauty of these pictures is really what I wanted to talk to Vivian and Neville about. It is very unusual to see pictures uh, this gorgeous of gardens. Uh, and at the same time that you celebrate the pictures for their technical excellence, understand equally the beauty of the gardens themselves. Uh, there's something kind of mesmerizing and even unbelievable about these pictures. And that's what drew me to want to participate in this project. And it's really what framed the questions that I had for Vivian and Neville. I wanted to understand uh, not only how did Neville make these pictures and what is it that inspires him in the gardens, but I wanted to understand how it is that Vivian uh, can make such extraordinary spaces. For me, uh, as a, a kind of amateur in this area, it is the pictures that prove that gardening uh, can really be an incredibly skilled endeavor. Hello, Vivian. Hello, Neville. How are you? Very, very well, well, thank, thank you. you. Wonderful. Uh, I'm very happy to see you uh, uh, in Toronto, in your home, and. Uh, it almost looks like a garden indoors uh, where you're sitting right now. But it is. This is our sunroom, our indoor garden. This is why we designed it so that we will always have a garden with us 365 days a year, regardless of the winter. That's wonderful and very, very appropriate for our conversation today. Uh, I want to welcome you both. Uh, we're going to be talking about your book, uh, Precious Moments. Um, uh, which I was fortunate enough to contribute an essay to, uh, an introduction. Um, it is uh, an absolutely beautiful book, and I have a series of questions that I want to ask you uh, about the book, but also about your experience together in your gardens. Um, and, you know, when I think about your gardens, I think of, uh, of what you do is quite separate. Uh, for example, Vivian really works on the garden. Uh, you are establishing, renewing, and maintaining uh, the plant life in your gardens. Uh, and Neville has been separately, uh, from my perception, independently photographing. Um, but you've now made this book as a collaboration, bringing together uh, your images, Neville, with, uh, with Vivian's experience of making the garden. And I want to know, do you collaborate in the garden in other ways. Um, while I was looking at the book, for example, I wondered if 
you ever get involved, Neville, in uh, raking or pruning? Um, uh, does Vivian ever ask for your help out in the garden? Well, um, my end of things is to admire Vivian's work, <laughs> the work. Uh, I do not work in the garden. <laughs> so I started in the, when I was very young in the school. In the back days, back in the late 40s and 50s, we actually had gardens of our own, which were inspected by our school teachers in our backyards. And we mm. were learning about soil, seeds, and the way nature looks after us. Uh, but since then, I am an observer, a photographic uh, recorder, uh, and I appreciate what Vivian does immensely. And she has motivated me to do things which I've never, never intended to do uh, because of the way she has constructed her garden and the varieties of, of plants that she has uh, uh, put her energy into. So I've a lot, learned a lot, uh, but physically I've contributed very little. Yes, I am the gardener. Um, <laughs> with the, uh, the experience and the knowledge of gardening. And Vivian, when did you start gardening? Um, you know, where, where did it begin for you? And uh, I assume long before you started your two present gardens. Uh, no, actually, I started with this house uh, almost 50 years ago. Uh, oh, my goodness. Um, in fact, um, yes, 1972, we moved into this house. This is our first and uh, only house in Toronto and my first garden. I mean, you know, the garden that we own. And I worked in uh, at this garden. Uh, at the beginning, I didn't have any help, but then I was a lot younger then. Mm. And I, <laughs> I worked hard. I liked the physical part as well, the, the exercise and learning about plants. I really knew very little about it, uh, but I, I learned from Neville's mother, who was a really good gardener, and uh, I would ask her questions. But most of my knowledge comes from experience. Trying and failing sometimes, trying and succeeding other times. Oh, yes. Well, you have to fail before you can succeed. For if sure. You really understand how things grow, how things work. You have to, you know, sometimes you're very successful and sometimes all of a sudden something die and you wonder why. And then, you know, instead of reading up on it, I usually ask gardeners, mm. people who are experienced, and I learn from them. One of the things that really strikes me looking at the photographs uh, in the book is how it does not at all look like you've ever failed. Um, the photographs are, uh, they show really, really stunning verdant uh, gardens throughout. Uh, and I know that a big part of that is the, the beauty of the gardens, the character of them after all of these years of cultivation. Uh, but it's also clear that a lot of that has to do with uh, Neville's photographs, uh, what he looks for. And so Neville, I have to ask you a very similar question. Uh, when did you get started as a photographer? What first interested you in taking pictures? Well, it goes back a long way, Paul. Um, I think I was 11 years of age when I first uh, received a nice camera from my father, who knew I was interested in photography. And it started, oddly enough, with cin cinematography, an uh, 8 millimeter uh, Revere uh, camera. I loved motion uh, because I was a child. I love playing and recording pictures of our friends uh, and in, in, in action. Uh, but then gradually realized that I would not get very, very far with motion picture, but I should capitalize on single frames of images and therefore went on to my first 35 millimeter camera, which was back in about 1950, 1945, 46. My father passed on to me his wonderful Zeiss icon then, uh, 35 millimeter camera. Uh, it was a wonderful uh, instrument. These lenses were not coated, but with black and white, you didn't need coating, except for some reflective uh, errors that could be uh, picked up or eradicated with coating. But the, the images from this camera were very excellent. And it stayed with me until high school, uh, in which case uh, I became very active with the school itself. And they saw Neville Poy with his camera everywhere. And they asked me to be the school photographer. 
And in fact, I took graduation pictures of the various classes. In addition to that, uh, I attended many of the dances. Um, I tend to be a wallflower myself, so the camera and I got together and I made images and made some money uh, for the participants, not very much, but it was something for me to do. And I printed all my own prints and sold them. So I was really motivated to carry on with them because I was getting lovely images, in my opinion, anyway. And I m moved up to a four by five, all of a sudden, four by five inch view camera, uh, a speed graphic. I bought that with money I made from painting uh, one of our one of my father's uh, houses that he rented out, uh, and it was a wonderful image uh, that it made. Because can you imagine a four by five inch negative compared to a thirty five millimeter negative? It was so sharp, and and the density of the the silver granules gave you some tremendous qualities of shades uh, that you could never get with a thirty five millimeter, millimeter format. Um, then color came along uh, in, in the early 40s, and I then transitioned to color because I loved the idea of adding color to it. Although I was very happy with black and white and later on stayed with black and white for a long time with a large format. But 35 millimeter laid itself open to wonderful colored images. And I developed color myself with ANSCO color in those days, which is home development. Um, then along the way, I said, the colors are vibrant. And we're gonna jump for a, a bit. After I met Vivian, she saw me make images and she loved the colored photographs. And I was so proud of my black and whites uh, at that time too, but she did not see the merits of uh, colored photography. <laughs> Even though black and white was really the true art form. And if you're a good black and white photographer, I think you've made it. Uh, color is sort of dramatic and tends to be overdone sometimes. So uh, moving on to my practice of medicine, um, fortunately, we did a lot of traveling despite my work, and I became a travel photographer. We mm -hmm. saw many different uh, sites uh, in, in the world, uh, various uh, ethnic groups, cities, and so forth. And it was both a study in, in uh, human life as it existed in other parts of the world, not just in North America, which we were cloistered into, and we were, my eyes were open to all types of deprivations and cultures that did not have what we had. So I recorded the way other people lived, and that broadened my uh, aspect of, of the other side of the world and made some really lovely images with that was very impactful. And then uh, I got interested in animal photography. And uh, we did a lot of animal photography in the areas we went to and birding, which I became very much uh, uh, interested in, uh, which led to longer and longer focal lengths and heavier equipment. Uh, and as we come to the book later on, I'll mention, uh, in my later days, I owned a very large telephoto lens uh, that weighed almost five pounds. At that time, my back began to cave in <laughs> with those problems. And photographing the hummingbirds in the cottage really did it. I was carrying this all day long. At the end of the day, I began to have my first bout of sciatica. So thanks to the camera, I developed a, a back problem. But I'm over that now. And I've learned. I've backed down to more moderate size lenses uh, and lighter equipment so I can carry on with what I'm doing. And that is a brief coverage of my experience with photography. And I intend to go on as long as I'm able to stand and walk. That's wonderful. And uh, you've obviously been engaged with photography for many decades. Uh, photography has changed quite a lot uh, more recently. Uh, and, uh, and I know that you work digitally now. Uh, I'm very curious uh, about the images in this book. Uh, over how many years were they made? And uh, are they all digital or are some of them from the earlier uh, period uh, shot on film originally? No, it's a, some of these uh, were uh, positives, uh, but none of them in this book are from my earlier works. All of them are digitally made. And um, my first camera, 35 millimeter, that was really a professional one was the uh, Nikon F. And it's a wonderful optics. 
and I have a lovely collection, but I did not do much animal photography in those days, nor plants. Um, so once I became digital, that's when I really exploded into the world of digital photography with much better ability to enhance uh, the post-capture uh, uh, image yeah. and pre-capture too. But one thing I've eliminated a lot from is uh, my filters. Uh, with uh, digital cameras, I did not need the filters I used to use for both black and white or film cameras. And uh, so the, the computer is the uh, no longer a dark room, they call it a light room now. It's opened up a new world of relaxation in the sunshine when I was recluse into the dark room with uh, negative films and chemistry developers. So I'm, I'm really uh, now emancipated from the hobby dictating uh, time spent in the dark room, uh, which was a great sacrifice. I'm an open air naturalist uh, enjoying uh, uh, fauna and, 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 and uh, animals uh, in, in wonderful uh, depictions of, of the image that I took of all of Vivian's flowers. But because she was interested in flowers, I gravitated more towards floral pictures because they're dramatic and I'm able to express them in a way that I could never do uh, with uh, color negatives uh, or chemistry developed color. So I have a lot to thank for digital cameras. I think most photographers are now becoming digital uh, for those very reasons. It opens up a new world facilitating things that we could never do with the limitation we had. Right. Um, uh... I want to turn now, Vivian, to uh, the question of your gardens, because one of the things that's so striking in the book is how uh, how spectacular they, they are. They're very formal, uh, beautiful gardens, but with a real element of wildness. Uh, and looking at the pictures, um, I had a sense that, uh, that there was nothing wrong in your gardens, but I know that can't be true. And so I wanted to ask you, uh, is there anything that you don't like about your gardens? Is there anything that you wish you could improve? Uh, is there anything you've always wanted to accomplish or achieve in your gardens but haven't been able to? Well, gardening is a continuous process. And right. that is uh, so interesting. Yes, I. whenever I go and look at my gardens, I can see what plants are doing really well. But then I also see the mistakes that others don't see, right? right? Unless you are a gardener, an experienced gardener, and you go close to it, you don't see the mistakes, and I do. And I always try to improve upon it. And if a plant isn't doing very well in a certain area, certain location, I take a mental note and make sure that it is moved after it's blooming, uh, moved in the fall, so that the following year it will do better. Yes, definitely, there are always mistakes. I think it's like life. You know, you always, you try to do everything right, but there are always mistakes and you try to improve upon it. And gardening is exactly the same. Mm. And Neville, is it the same for you with photography? Um, uh, are, are there things that you've wanted to capture in uh, Vivian's gardens that you've been unable to get? Uh, are there things that you still aspire to show uh, when you're photographing in the gardens? Well, Paul, that's a very interesting question. Um, I think in retrospect, uh, there were things I could have done. I can't be specific about it, but I'm sure I was, I've been frustrated on many occasions. But uh, if I've been frustrated with something, uh, I will try to work on it and make it uh, workable. Uh, if I don't, cannot do it, then I will not pursue it and will drop the, the, that aspect of the, the photography altogether. And that's the way I cull uh, the images that I would not include in any production or showing that I would have. If I don't like it, it doesn't exist. Uh, I, I, for this book, I've been very happy with the images that we've chosen. Uh, and I think that... Um, it, uh, it reflects the fact that this is a type of uniformity I would like to achieve in my floral uh, and plant uh, for photographs. Mm. Uh, one thing that I wanted to ask you about, um, 
uh, is the book itself, because the book, as you've said, is a distillation of uh, many gardens, many seasons, uh, many images that you made over time. And it includes some images, more recent ones, but, uh, but not a lot of the images that you've made. You've actually made far more. Uh, I wonder how it is that you worked together uh, to make this book. And I, I see the book right there. Uh, would you mind holding it uh, so that we can see it? Um, it's, it's quite beautiful. Uh, it's, it's very interestingly um, organized uh, by season. And, uh, and it was sequenced uh, very methodically and carefully. And I wonder, is that something that you worked on together? Uh, was there something general that you were trying to convey with your selections and your editing? No, actually, I was the one who made that decision. Um, Neville does the photography, and I was the one who organized the book and decide on what season to start and what to end. And I just thought that it is nice to, you know, the, the way it is that um, uh, to have the, 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 all the flowers and everything, and then really end up with spring at the, at the end. Somehow, you know, winter, I didn't want it to end in winter. Right. Because, because it's a floral book. It's about gardens, about life, uh, you know, uh, the, the birds and the butterflies and the, and the bees. And uh, so it should be very colorful from at the beginning and at the end. But the, we want to include all the seasons. The one thing um, I would like to add about that is uh, because I'm interested in photography, I will make images 365 days a year. So by virtue of that, I would have images made in all four seasons. So we had a large collection uh, upon which to draw. So Vivian and I went over these after her concept of the four seasons, which is just wonderful. And we were able to allocate the ones that we took during cold, uh, cold weather, warm weather, and in, in between weather, spring and fall. And it's worked out very, very well as a logical sequence of the four seasons. Right. And one of the things that's, uh, that's very interesting about the book is that there are um, texts. I mean, I, I would call them captions, except that they are uh, very often more uh, elaborate than that, more lengthy. And these are moments when Vivian talks about uh, what we see in the pictures, or sometimes she's simply inspired by what's going on in the picture to talk about some aspect of her experience gardening. Um, uh, or how she and you experience uh, the garden. So I'm curious how that came about. Why did you decide to blend uh, the photographs with uh, writing in this way? Well, I didn't think it should be just a photographic book um, okay. because I wanted to talk about how important nature is mm. to, uh, to our lives in a different way. To me, it, it, it gives me balance right. in my life. Uh, uh, nature is extremely important to me because I do live a very busy, uh, uh, in fact, uh, but also a public, very public life. So these are my, what, that's why it's called precious moments. These are my precious moments. Mm -hmm. They are the, the moments that give me stability in my life. And mm -hmm. uh, and it is what I have written, uh, my feelings and my expressions during those moments. And there, there really is that feeling, I have to say, there really is that feeling that we're uh, being led inside of, a, of a, not necessarily a private world, but a very personal world. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and that's in the tone, both of the pictures and the writing. Uh, and um, uh, and it, it, as a transition, it makes me realize that your garden really does come right inside your home. And, and in fact, right now you're sitting, uh, as you said, in your um, in your sunroom, and we can see um, the garden all around you, the indoor manifestations of it. Uh, one of the things that's really unique about your practice as a gardener is your indoor gardening. And I wonder if you can talk about that a little bit. Uh, for example, you bring... Uh, many plants indoors, and they seem to thrive uh, all seasons indoors. 
but you also dry flowers. Uh, you take some flowers and you dry them and they take on a kind of new life um, after they are no longer in the ground. Uh, so I wonder if you can talk to us about how you do that, how you learn to do it. Uh, and I know this is a strange question, but why do you think you're so good at it? Oh, <laughs> um, well, it's experience, you know, practice makes perfect. Um, I actually never learn about drying flowers from anyone. It is mm. from my observation. Bec uh, when I first did it, I was, you know, I love decorating with flowers. And I've noticed certain flowers remain firm where even when they go dry. Then mm. I decided at, at the very, very beginning, and this goes back many years ago, I would keep them and keep them over the winter because they didn't need any, any water. And then I figured, yes, you know, I would l make sure that I cut these flowers at the right time so that they will dry. Some, if you cut them too early, you see, it's just being very observant. And I am a very observant person. When I'm out, I can, I can see everything. Nothing seemed to escape me whenever I'm, wherever I look. And, uh, and I know when flowers should be cut that I know they will be able to dry. Uh, uh, in a, they will remain the, in the same shape in the dry form. And also, since, since then, there are, I know there are some that will, the petals will fall. So what I do, um, I hang them, you know, like peonies. They're like roses. They need to be hung you know, at, at the sort of a, at the right stage, you have to cut them and then hang them upside down. They re retain the color and really it's trial and error. I would try that on anything. And then if they, after they dry, they look wonderful. I use them. If they don't look wonderful, then they go in the garbage. And, uh, and it's a lot of fun. It keeps me busy. And in the summer, of course, I'm out in the garden, I'm walking all the time. But when fall comes, uh, the garden goes to sleep. That is when I really do my dry flowers. They can be inside right through the winter. I have flowers everywhere, aside from the ones that are alive. Right, right. Um, and Neville, this is a question primarily for you, though. I, I think it applies to both of you. But, but you've mentioned uh, that as a photographer, that you've gravitated toward uh, photographing your travels uh, and increasingly through the years, nature, um, uh, all of which is represented in this book, uh, animal life, uh, plant life, um, both, uh, both uh, contained and wild. And I'm very curious how your experience of Vivian's gardens has actually affected your view of nature when you are away from home, when you are traveling, um, do you look at uh, forests, do you look at um, public gardens differently now because of your experience in the gardens that you have at home in Toronto and Muskoka? Yes, um, we, we do travel uh, extensively and we have visited many uh, gardens throughout the world, um, both um, organized and somewhat disorganized. Uh, I've learned that I'm very much interested in photographs taken where there are waterways uh, so that we have reflection of uh, both arbors, trees, uh, and plants, and in water plants. Uh, for example, we visited um, uh, Monet's uh, water gardens and his gardens uh, in uh, Giverny in France. Uh, and uh, we were absolutely taking uh, wonderful images of the, the profluence of colorful flowers of, of every species in these exorbitant mm -hmm. gardens. They can barely walk without touching flowers. And his water lily gardens are wonderful. And I didn't get the idea of that before this book. I've always enjoyed the water lilies we've had up north and Vivian had planted some colorful ones in our bay. So I know what reflections are like together with autumn, autumnal colors in the trees that reflect. And you'll see these images in the book. But seeing Monet, who was much 
uh, before my time, doing this uh, was a revelation that I've, uh, I've followed in his pathways without really, really knowing it. Most of his images uh, are impressionistic and sort of fuzzy and out of focus and giving a, 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 an array of subtle tones, both strong but mostly soft. And one of my ophthalmologist friends said, you know why Monet's uh, uh, images that he made were really somewhat fuzzy and nebulous and dreamy-like? I said, no. Well, because he was short-sighted and was never corrected properly. It was a <laughs> <laughs> so that was nice. Uh, at any rate, um, um, I, I, I've learned a lot from what we've seen. Vinny has learned a lot too, I'm sure. But uh, we love perennial gardens because they perpetuate themselves so well every year. And you have a nice flow of species that takes, them, takes you from spring right to fall. Uh, then it, it's a nucleus of, of plants that you don't have to replant. You have to look after them and make sure they uh, revive themselves in a way that is nurtured and can blossom str uh, with strength every year. So perennial gardens, I'm really much in favor of, and Vivian's, most of her gardens are perennial uh, gardens as well. Um, I'm really curious about this recent period. We are, you know, fingers crossed, uh, emerging from the pandemic that has kept all of us uh, um, confined much closer to home, um, much more concerned with our safety. Uh, and I'm wondering whether you were um, isolated through much of this, and if so, how that affected your own experience of the garden. Did it change anything at all? Um, did you spend more time working in your gardens and photographing the gardens? Uh, and how do you think it will change your experience of the gardens now that you are able to roam a little more freely uh, from home? Well, I, I'm the one who take long walks mm -hmm. um, and I'm seeing, actually I'm seeing a lot more and noticing even more uh, because we can't travel in really for the last year and a half, uh, Yes, I'm spending more time noticing the gardens, our gardens particularly. Uh, I do enjoy other people's gardens, where, uh, especially in the neighborhood when I'm walking around. I, I've noticed things that uh, for the last almost 50 years I have not noticed because we always go by these houses and now I walk past them. Um, but I, uh, at the same time, uh, I see more parts of my own gardens that need improvement. Uh, uh, both, you know, this book covers two gardens, uh, the one in Toronto and the one in Muskoka. And um, when I was busy going all over the place and traveling, I didn't have as much time. Now, in the past two summers now, this is the second summer, I have more time and I have uh, made, you know, steps to improve our gardens further. And mm -hmm. I, mistakes that might have passed me before no longer get passed. Interesting. And I assume that um, uh, some of this is to do with the fact that in an ordinary year, your schedule uh, takes you away from home, uh, probably pretty frequently. Um, maybe even more than you uh, would have liked from the perspective of gardening. Uh, so that is, I guess, uh, um, uh, that has been a bit in abeyance over these last two years uh, and given you more time to think about it. That's really, really interesting. I think we'll, we'll all be curious uh, to see how things change now that, um, again, uh, my fingers crossed uh, that we are able to get out more. Um, and um, I, I have to say, uh, one of the things that I wondered while looking at the book, because uh, as I mentioned, there's this feeling of, um, of perfect beauty inside the images. Uh, I wondered whether uh, photographing the garden is over for Neville. Uh, Neville, are you still taking pictures of the garden? Do you still have uh, uh, ideas of things you'd like to do? Yes, I do. Because, you know, the gardens, like nature, is a never-ending story, no matter where you are. And I can drive as much pleasure within our own property, uh, which is quite extensive in Muskoka and more limited in the city, 
but you don't have to go very far to be really creative in photographic uh, arts when you devote it to, in, to nature, from minute in, in animals and insect life to larger uh, animals like the bears and the, the, the uh, uh, deer that we have on our property and beavers. They will always give us different postures and different activities that I can capture and render them in more aspects of their lives, daily lives, uh, that I would have not, it's only the beginning of studying them in detail. And talking about that, it's interesting. With animal photography, I found I developed a relationship, I think, I may be imagining it, uh, wishy, wishful thinking, <laughs> a relationship with animals. Now, um, I can't uh, talk with the animals like the uh, doctor, what's his name? Uh, anyway, uh, I, but I do relate to them. Now, for instance, we have a, uh, an image of a moose, a, a cow moose that I met on the road coming into the property. And I was alone in the car, I stopped because she was about 50 feet away. And I got out of the car and she approached me up to about 20 feet or even slightly closer. And if you look at her, she has an inquisitive look on her face, uh, cocked eyed almost, one ear lower than the other, and just stared at me and I stared back. And we studied each other, I'm sure for a good 10 minutes. And there must have been sort of the unspoken word because we enjoyed each other's company. Then after a while, she I guess said, well, I think I know this fellow well enough. And slowly staggered out of the picture into the woods. Now that is nice to be able to come so close to nature. Uh, and the, the sequence of bear pictures, the black bears that come to visit us to pick the uh, apples from the apple trees. I was working with them and Vivian noted that too. And we were up to them very, very closely. And I got extremely close up to about 10 feet from a couple of them to photograph them. The worst thing you can do is to approach cubs too closely with a mother bear there. But we had several cubs with a mother and one adolescent. And the mother was very forgiving. You can see her with flowers around her backside. And here I was, she was looking at me, not with a, a, a threatening, threatening uh, gaze, a sort of friendly gaze. And there were her pups in the trees and I was photographing them. I was not afraid and she didn't intimidate me in any way. So there's a relationship that develops. With birds, you have to be very, very careful how you deal with them. Uh, but I think with the hummingbirds particularly, uh, Vivian's types of flowers she grows yeah. has a nectar that attracts them. So we have an abundance of, of, of these um, beautiful small little birds uh, that um, come from across the, the uh, Gulf of Mexico, flying all the way back here and down south again, uh, flying back and forth and I was able to get them with my presence right almost next to them. They were not afraid of my presence whatsoever. And I also have rescued them. Oddly enough, unfortunately, animals like the, the birds see the reflection in, in windows, particularly near the lake. And they think they're flying off into water when there's suddenly the impact of the glass. And the hummingbirds near the water in a boathouse fly in the windows and I've had to resuscitate one particular one that struck it and then sputtered off to the middle of the lake like a, an airplane in the war that's been shot smoking behind and then into the water. I dashed out in my, my, my small boat with a motor on it and I rescued her. She didn't sink, brought her back to the land, wiped her down and took about an hour, but she got her breath back and then flew off again. So I just feel wonderful about, about our relationship with them and they weren't afraid of me. So I think if you're careful and you don't frighten them, uh, they will cooperate with you. The deer we have are part, like the uh, friends of a family, like the dogs. And they come and they lie on our lawn, uh, newborns with the white specks, just almost cuddling up to us. So that's a feeling that we, we gotten very personalized with like people working with zoo animals but their captive audience ours are wild and it, they've taken their liking to us and I to them and Vivian to them so it's a relationship that we developed and we can carry on with despite what goes on outside of our property and what goes on with the COVID world we'll always have 
our comfort with our fauna and flora within our property. Mm. That relationship really does come through in the pictures. You you have such a sense of uh, of harmony uh, throughout the pictures, throughout the seasons, uh, and that really is captured uh, in the book. So um, I think that people will really see that, um, and it's very good to know that it's real, um, that it's not just something that I sensed in the pictures, but in fact something that you are uh, really experiencing day to day uh, in your gardens. Um, thank you both so much uh, for, uh, for spending this time uh, talking to me uh, and answering these questions for people who uh, will be interested in your book. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Thank Paul. you. You're very welcome, Paul. Thank you. It's been a pleasure and a great opportunity for us. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hi everybody, my name is Justin Poy and I am Vivian and Neville's son. We're so delighted you could join us today for the virtual launch of Precious Moments. It's unfortunate that we couldn't all be together in person, but it's wonderful to see all of us come together and overcome these still challenging times. This is the first collaboration between my mother and father on this type of project. My mother has published many books before, mostly historical, some of which are also under our family's own publishing house, Callianne Publishing. But this book is a combination of my father's incredible photographs, some of which are the most beautiful he's ever taken, and perhaps some of the most beautiful I've ever seen. And my mother's chronicling of her observations of, of nature and wildlife, as well as her own love and passion of gardening. There's something about the creativity of both of them that comes together perfectly in this book. There's just something about the chemistry of the written word and the vibrant visual depictions of my father's photo photographs that bring about a feeling of calmness, something that we could all use a bit of during these times. I wanna thank everyone at Ryerson University, my alma mater, and an institution that is very dear to my heart for helping us launch this book today. All the proceeds will go to Ryerson University. I want to especially thank Dr. Mohamed Lashemi, President and Vice Chancellor of Ryerson, and Janice Fukakusa, Chancellor of Ryerson University, for their kind remarks, and of course, our good friend, Christian Mehta, Assistant Vice President of Engagement, and his team for working so diligently on this, along with Ryerson, the Ryerson Imaging Center and its director, Paul Roth, for doing such a beautiful forward for the book. The one great thing about having your own publishing company is that you get to make all the decisions. You will see that no expense has been spared in the production of this book. And book publishing is truly a lost art. When you lift this book up, you will feel the quality and the thought and care that has been put into this piece. From the richness of the colors to the weight of the stock, this is top quality throughout. In fact, the color process for printing this book was an industry software update that took place just months before we went to press. So today, you are seeing the results of some truly new technology. We've also decided to provide every book with a solid, beautiful box with a magnetic flap and a silk string to gently lift the book out so that it will remain in pristine condition and it will look as good in 10 years as it does today. After all, we needed to treat it as the jewel it is. It will make a beautiful gift as a coffee table book for family and friends. Thank you everyone for joining us today to share this precious moment. <laughs>